Thank you, Christy. Thank you, Ron. My name is Daryl Ward. I'm the executive director of the Folk Arts and Cultural Alliance. Previous to that, I did a little stint at Southeastern University. And previous to that, I was a public educator for 32 years. Um, uh, I was principal at uh, Harrison School for the Arts for seven years in Lakeland. So I've been fortunate to be around a lot of fantastically talented arts people. But I always tell people that whatever title I have, I'm really at heart a recovering English teacher. That's really what I am, as I did that for 15 years. And so um, I'm, I have to say, because of my position at, at, at the Polk Arts and Cultural Alliance, I sometimes get asked to judge. I think I've judged three or four different um, um, shows, exhibits from Bartow to Lakeland, et cetera. And I kudos to Ron and to Christy. Uh, their process was very smooth. It was very professional, made it very easy for the judge to kind of figure out what, what, you know, what I was thinking and so forth and so on. So I, I appreciate that. It was really good. And they bought me, you know, lunch. So that didn't hurt you. <laughs> so um, I, I, I have to start with, I always hate when people do this. So you have to forgive me. I have to start with a disclaimer. Okay. And I call it the critique, the critiquer's disclaimer. Because we'll talk a little bit about critiques for a second before I dive in. I know you want to hear about your stuff, but I think it's also important for you to understand the perspective of the person who is who was judging, evaluating, selecting, etc. What what was what was he or she thinking? And so I, I look at critiques. Um, I think there are really two purposes for critiques. Right. First purpose is that they, they show, they, they, if you're an artist, and by the way, I have to back up real quick as a caveat, I'm an artist myself. I do fine art landscape photography, shameless plug. You can find my brand new website at darylwardphotography.com, D-A-R-Y-L, um, Daryl Ward Photography. Um, I, I travel around, I've, in the last nine months, I've been to Portugal, uh, Scotland, and Death Valley, and those are very different places. <laughs> I take pictures. Um, fine art nature. I don't take pictures of people. Um, that's not my thing. So I come at it from an artist's perspective too, right? I, as Ron said, I've been on your side as well. And and I've critiqued and I've been critiqued. And that recovering English teacher thing wasn't exactly a joke. I mean, it was, but the truth of the matter is my whole career has been about critiquing, right? If you were a student in my class, you were an English student in my class and you turned in a paper, it was getting critiqued. That was what they were paying me to do. Now, it, you didn't get a prize, you got a letter grade, right? A, B, C, D. But it was the same thing. So I've been critiquing for a long time. And, I, and I've learned that critiquing kind of comes at it, like I said, in two ways. One is to make you better at what you're doing. So, right, I provide you feedback so that you listen to it, take it, hopefully, and then produce a better product. If you were my English student, it would be a better paper next time. Perhaps it might be a better painting, a better photograph or whatever. Now, it's, I have to insert my own little critique story here. I've told you guys this because I hope it'll give you a little bit of an angle from which I'm coming from. So I entered a piece and, and got selected in the Lakeland Arts Association's Melvin show last year. It's a photograph of the desert. And it was two photographs. It was the same photograph of a rock and a tree because it's the desert, um, but from different angles. And um, my wife and I were going out to dinner the night of the reception, and she said, what time do we need to be there? I said, well, they're doing a critique at 4.30. I said, but we don't need to go to the critique. We used to go to the reception, and then we'll go to dinner. And she goes, so why don't you want to go to the critique? And I said, because I don't care what that lady says. <laughs> and I didn't mean it arrogantly. I didn't mean it rudely. I meant no matter what she says about the photograph, I ain't taking it differently. That's how I'm going to take the picture. And again, not arrogant. I just... So my wife's like, okay, whatever, get in the car. So we go. And sure enough, I got there late. I didn't hear the critique, didn't care. And when I walked in, some of the other people that were there were like, hey, congratulations. And I'm like, what are you talking about? And they said, your, your photograph won honorable mention. And by the way, the, 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 the judge is over there if you want to talk to him. So I make a beeline over there. <laughs> to my wife says like, I thought you didn't care what she said. So, well, that was before I won a prize. <laughs> but that's only the... Part A of the funny part of the story to me. So the lady tells me that she critiqued, it was a diptych, it was, I told you, two photos. And she goes talk to me about what she liked about it, which was great. And then she said, by the way, I really like the photo on the left. And as a matter of fact, if you wouldn't have included the other photo, you probably, I probably would have rated you higher. And then I said, well, thank you very much. And I walked away and I started kind of laughing to myself. And my wife said, what are you laughing at? I said, because I entered the solo photo in, a P, in, a, in an exhibition last year and didn't get anything. 
right? So I share that with you to say everybody's biased. Everybody, including me. And the best I can do as someone critiquing your work is own those biases, kind of share them with you, because they you, you'll get some perspective as we go through and we look at the pieces. And when I'm talking about, by the way, improving yourself as a, as one purpose of a critique, right? The other purpose is for me to tell you what I liked. The, uh, these are the pieces. These are the pieces I liked. And I can tell you why I like them. Doesn't mean they're that the pieces that didn't get are bad. This is why I like them. And by the way, those aren't the, always the same thing, right? Improving you and telling you why I like they, they, those may not be the same thing. So here are here are the biases I have as we go through, right? First thing is, I believe, because again, this is the English teacher in me, I believe titles are important. Now that doesn't mean that you can't have a work that's untitled, that's fine, you can. Um, I would never put a piece in a show that's untitled because as an artist, I use the title to, to accompany whatever my, in my case, photograph is to drive how I want the viewer to interact with it, okay? You don't have to. But you need to know that I like titles. I like to see how they work with whatever's presented. I also really like narratives. I like to see pieces of art that tell a story. Those, those resonate with me. Does every piece of art have to tell a story? That's not what I'm saying. But it does when I'm judging. All right? That's, that's where you see where we're going with this. Third thing is presentation is important. How does it look? How, how did you show it to the judge? And, and that makes a difference. It's, it's totally different, you know, on your computer versus on your easel versus how you frame, whatever it is, right? Those are different and they impact how someone that's viewing it, in my case, the judge, how I interact with the piece. Um, as I shared with you, I'm a photographer myself. Hint, hint, I'm going to lean toward photographs. I'm, I'm owning that right now. Doesn't mean that let's pretend this was a show with no photographs in it. Could I judge it? Sure, I could. But that's just my, that's my natural bias to this. And then I really like original approaches to things. Someone looking at maybe something that we've all seen hundreds of times and, and, and looking at it in a different way. And that's kind of where I want to end up before we get specific with the judges is that my hope is that as a part of my critiques, and I hate that word, but my comments on the work that, that we're going to talk about this afternoon is that you come away from it looking at your work again. Let me say that again. I want you to look at your work again. Maybe I want you to look at your work anew because I think we would all agree, if we're being really honest, who, who amongst us is the worst judge of our work? We are, right? And so when someone says to me about my own work, hey, blah, 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 and, and, and I get critiqued all the time at home. <laughs> um, my wife will say, I don't like this, I don't like this. And, I'll, and, I, and I, so, but sometimes her comments, because I do respect her, cause me to look at my work different. I may still do it the same way, but it causes me to look at it different. So I hope after we go through this this afternoon, that regardless of what, what wins prizes, what doesn't win prizes, that you'll look at your work anew from a, from a different perspective that someone's provided. Okay? All right, let's rock and roll here. First, um, honorable mention, this is Jeannie Cavlish, and this piece is entitled The Great Beyond. Great it's Beyond. Um, doesn't matter to me, but is Jeannie here? No, I'm talking to her. Ah, are you texting? All right, she could get on Zoom. So um, this is a photograph, and what I liked about it was its painterly effect, right? It, was, it wasn't just a documentary style photograph. Nothing wrong with those, but this kind of spoke to me. And again, I've got a little bit of a story going. I know it's hard to see because it's small. Got a little bit of a you can walk on the water. I got a little bit of a story going on with that. I'm wondering what that is. Now, by the way. Another thing a critiquer looks for is not just the title, but is there a theme and to what degree does the work represent that theme? And granted, this, this wasn't, if I'm right, Ron, wasn't necessarily a theme, but the title of the show is Aviation and, and Flight. So there's, there's got to be some connection there. That kind of goes without saying in this instance. 
I will say, this is something we all can maybe take. I don't want to say learn from, because maybe you already do this really well. Presentation's important. I would wonder if that piece I might have rated higher if it were matted. I don't know. It's hard for me to know that because I can't see it that way. But if it were matted so that it, it brought out elements of the photo a little better, you'll notice that. And I want to be careful not to, to I'm not trying to slam anybody for their choice of framing because that, believe me, I, I'm in your world, too. I'm trying to frame as e economically as possible, like we all are. When I die, I want to come back as a frame <laughs> because my gracious is expensive. So I get all that. But uh, but this is kind of, if you can sort of tell, almost a shadow box this frame. And I think that maybe detracts a little bit from my viewing connection with it. Um, but I do, I did like it. I did, I did like the story that, that I thought was there. So maybe that would be different. And I have to say maybe, because I don't know if I, what it would look like if it were matted in a different frame. But I do wonder if that might have impacted how I would have how I would connect. Give her a hand. Oh. Any questions about Jeannie's piece before we go to the next one? Good. good. You're a good class. Okay. The next honorable mention goes to Dana Day Dodge, and this is Waiting for a Flight, and it's watercolor, of course. All right. So, Dana here. Okay. Hey. So, this is, and we didn't choose this on purpose, but this works great. This is exactly what I was talking about with the last one about how the matting really accentuates this particular piece. I don't have a choice as a viewer, but to be drawn exactly to what Dana wants me to see. And he must also understand, I was sharing this, and this is important, this is my philosophy. I'm not one of those people, you can be this way, you're entitled to be wrong. I'm not one of those people, <laughs> that was a joke. I'm not one of those people that thinks that I want the viewer to see whatever they want to see when they see my piece. No, I want them to see what I want them to see. I did it, right? So in other words, I like pieces that direct me. Yeah, I can bring in my imagination. I can, I'm going to bring in my perspective, but I like pieces that direct me to see, to feel, to experience what the artist wants me to feel, not what I want to feel. Okay, if I wanted you to feel whatever, I just put a blank canvas up and say, have at it, <laughs> right? So I think that she did a really good job. The technique is really good. I also love the idea of waiting for a flight. I like things that talk about the, the experience of aviation that weren't necessarily the, good just good. about good. the good ones. Yeah, <laughs> that weren't just about the, the experience of flying per se. So kudos to you on, on that. Uh, I thought it was a really good piece. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. You keep walking around. Anybody have a question about Dana's piece? All right. I don't know if you Okay. The next honorable mention goes to Magdalene Lima. Paleo. Yeah, I, I always mess it up and apologize. And this is Florida Flava and it's oils. Yeah. So this again is a really good example of what I started talking about, about kind of my own biases and perspectives of the, 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 the artist using the title to direct me as a viewer as to what, what they were trying to communicate. And I really, I really got the, obviously this is, you know, I get a sense of Florida here. Um, I was joking, but it's not a total joke with Christy. You know, when I first saw this, it really resonated with me because I live in the flight path of those damn Amazon planes in Lakeland. <laughs> and this is what it reminded me of. <laughs> um, and so there was, a, there was, you know, it was it's silly, but it's true. It was a connection with it. And I really appreciated, uh, I also appreciated the technique, the subtle, if you can see, the reflection that she's got going on down in the, in the water here of the of the plane up above, as well as again the Florida wildlife. I am, you know, admittedly I'm a sucker. I'm a I'm, I'm a, a Floridian. I'm a sucker for Florida art. So I thought it was really well done. Thank you. Yeah, I'll take it. Any questions about this piece? Yeah, for quiet today. That's because I'm explaining the stew out of them. <laughs> Okay, our next honorable mention goes to Gary Chapel for exciting flight, and this is a photograph, and it's big. So yeah, it's big. Name. Is Gary here? He's uh, right there. Oh, hey, Gary. <laughs> oh, we'll talk to the camera. So, 
Um, this is a really good example, I think, um, of how, and, and I learned, again, I, I, you know, I'm selfish too. I'm learning from what all you are doing. Um, this is a really good example, of, and I'm thinking of this as a photographer myself, about how important scale is, right? The, the scale of this, let me put it to you this way. I can almost guarantee you, can't say 100%, almost 100% guarantee you, I would not have chosen this piece if Gary would have chosen it to be sized five by seven. Yep. Yep. Right? So he's purposely choosing something of, of this, of this, I believe, fighter jet, right? That, that he wants it to be a dominant impact. And so the scale of this piece really matters. Um, I don't say that the scale matters in every piece people do, right? We've had some, some examples already where those weren't large pieces. But in this case, the scale, I mean, obviously it's bright, it's colorful, it's, it's photographically speaking, uh, it's well executed um, in terms of how he has, you know, you get, you know, and this is, I try not to get too technical. We all, we all have our tech, hopefully we all understand our technique. I understand about the rules of thirds in photography. I understand that he's got the jet. So there's enough room over here. So right, if you had crammed that jet up against the edge of the frame, it would have bothered us, right? Why? Because it's flying that way. It needs room to fly, right? So, so Gary's done all that right. But that's secondary to me as much as just the way the image resonates and it resonates because of its color and its scale. It's impactful. Yeah, it's impactful for that. And this is where not every piece works to be large. Sometimes it doesn't matter the size of your piece. But in this case, it, it does. And I think that was really uh, he's well watching, done, Gary. He's watching right now. Well done, Gary. Now we're moving into the... Go right now back to another big piece. Yeah. This is Tony Rizzo, and this is photography, and it is Head in the Clouds. <laughs> Tony here? No. Nope. All right, no Tony. So, I mean, I, I wouldn't say anything if you were or weren't here, but um, I'm, an, I'm, I'm an equal opportunity offender, I'll tell you. Um, this is another one, exactly what we just said about scale. Now, this might have worked as a smaller photo, but the scale does it is impactful because of it. I also think, again, as I said earlier on, the title of it, Head in the Clouds. Um, and, and again, the technical aspect of how the, the, the child is, is um, disproportionately large, it, done on purpose, right, with the clouds behind it. And then there's also something I think most of us would agree, because remember, I told you I love stories. And there's something we all probably can kind of get out of this, of, of, of the childlike wonder of flight and the imagination that that takes. Um, and, and this artist did a really good job of, of, of bringing that out uh, with this particular work. Um, if the artist were here, and this is just a curious statement, because I don't know, I don't know if, if this is the actual way the image was set up and shot, because again, I'm speaking from a photographer standpoint, some of you are photographers, or, or is it a composite? In other words, did he shoot? It looks like a composite to me too. It doesn't matter. I'm just curious about it. Um, it would be tricky to to shoot it otherwise. I yeah. mean, I guess you could, but it would be weird. You, yeah. <laughs> you, but um, but even more though, right? Even if the artist manipulates it in, in post processing, that's still uh, you know the post processing is a tool, and this artist is choosing to try and communicate to us, the viewer, through the use of those tools. And this is about this is another one that really works with scale. That was um, an award of excellence. Yes, thank you. We're up into the awards of excellence, which I think there are three, right? Three. So there's two more of those left. And the next one goes to Sandy Henry, and this is Birds of a Feather, and it's watercolor. All right, I didn't see Sandy. No, I know Sandy. Um, and this is a good example, kind of of scale again but on the opposite scale, right? The intimate nature of the small watercolor birds. I also like the idea that um, she's choosing another element of, of aviation and flight that, that is a little bit, it's not, it's not that it's uncommon. It, it happens to be less common in this particular show. There, are, there were other pictures of birds, but, but most of them were, as you might imagine, of, of, of 
flying flying machines. Um, but I liked that these were small, intimate portraits that also revealed, you know, a good technique in terms of the watercolor, as well as communicating to me, the viewer. Um, I, I, think, I, I do think, ironically, not all of them are flying, um, but just a nice. Um, and I and I think that another appealing thing about this was the variety collage. and the collage style, which remember I talk about presentation. Um, that goes a long way. And the fact that these are presented like this and they're, and they're separate pieces, but they're presented in a unified manner, I thought was, was really good. And Sandy knows I like the work. I didn't know that was Sandy's, but it's not surprising. Questions? Nope. Last award of excellence, right? Excellence goes to Catherine Duncan. You can clap, <laughs> and this is Snowy Refuge, and it's gouache. All right, Snowy Refuge. Um, now, this is another one that, again, it's got a little narrative going on with the plane and, and the snow, um, but I really liked the whimsical nature of this particular piece, and as when, when Ron walks around, you'll be able to see it. It's, it's a little bit different approach than most of what, what I saw in today's show. Um, I thought the colors were very nice. Um, it, it really uh, communicates. One of the things that, that I would caution um, all of us about is being very careful is this, this plane is almost getting chopped off by the mat. Um, so you wanna, you wanna think carefully about, about that and the, the, the way that in, impacts your work. Um, and how that is, is seen. I didn't think it detracted terribly from this, but it, it could, you know, especially if it was too close over here, for example, or something, it would have made it, it wouldn't have looked right with the plane and the way it was going. But I was very impressed with, um, and I was also impressed with the size of this piece. It, it was it was not too large, but it was large enough that as a, as a viewer, I could really get a sense for what the artist was trying to do here with this. So, questions, mom? Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's good work. She's a former Harrison student. Ah, what's her last name? Duncan. She, she's only been out of there two years. Yeah, I must have missed her. Yeah, because I've been out almost five. I've been out like it was a prison sentence. I've been out five. <laughs> All right, we're getting down to the nitty gritty here. Okay. We're in third place. Diane Adams. And this is Ready to Fly, and it's a watercolor. All right, Diane. Where's Diane? Hey, Diane. So. Well, let me tell you what I like about this. Obviously, the technique is really good. The watercolor, my wife's a watercolor, so I appreciate, I see how she, how hard, it, how difficult medium it can be and why I would never personally do it. Um, but I liked, th this just goes to show you sometimes about what you, you just don't know what's going to click with the judge. You know what, one of the strongest pieces, part about this piece was? I love, and, and you, if you didn't do this on purpose, Diane, you'd nod your head and say you did. <laughs> I, I like the intentional cropping here. I don't, I don't see the rest of the plan. Now, another judge may tell you that, was, that would have been a detriment, but I actually liked that it was a very purposeful, tight crop where we don't see the entire plane. She could have chosen to paint the entire plane, but for whatever reason, don't tell us, that's for us to figure out. She chose to just focus on this section of it. Yeah, it's great technique. I, you really feel like you're looking at the plane. The watercolor is beautiful. But just the fact that she did a tight crop on. So the lesson for me, um, you know, again, I'm very selfish. The lesson for me as a photographer is to go back and look at some of my work and say, can that work be better? Could that picture be better if I crop it tighter? Either next time I'm shooting or go in my computer and tighten in on a part of that image. It changes the way the image is perceived. If you've not ever tried that, think about it. Limited palette, too. Yes, yeah, so that, that, thank you very much. That, that is a very limited palette. It's not very bright. Um, I wouldn't call it pastel, but it's close, right? It's very muted, um, which also works really well. Right? Everything doesn't have to be all flowers and bird of paradise. It's Florida, I know, but you know, we don't all need swans. We don't all need, right? Um, we all need palm trees, though, right? So, if you, <laughs> um, but it's really, really nice piece. So congratulations. Anybody have any questions about this piece? Second place. Second place. Lorraine Goldberg. And this is Flight Delay. 
All right. The rain, right? All right. So, man, I got to tell you, I debated between this piece and the next piece is first place. You were, it was very close. So kudos to you on that. And, and again, Chrissy has a great a way of doing these shows. She said, I want you to walk through one time. So, you know, just so you know, I walk through one time. I don't say anything. She doesn't say anything. We just walk through. I'm looking and looking and looking. Next time I go through, I'm looking at, are there any pieces that really don't, I don't feel should be in the show? And there weren't a lot, but there were a few. Not, not everybody's piece got in. Um, and then the third time I'm starting to figure out what pieces we want to come back for judging. I will tell you, even though we didn't verbalize this, um, this piece um, stood out to me from almost the very beginning. And it stood out that way because, A, um, it's a photograph. I told you. I'm, 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 I'm biased that way. But secondly, I love the fact that it's telling me a story about an experience we've all had, which is a polite delay. And we've all either been in this chair or we've seen people in that chair. And any piece of art that resonates that deeply with us, I think is a good piece of art, right? And by the way, good, be careful with that word, right? But I'm just defining good as it resonates. Doesn't mean you may hang it on your wall or whatever, but it's a good piece of art. And I thought she did a great job of capturing a very candid moment um, that we've all experienced. Um, and the title didn't hurt, right, with that. I mean, and you could have gone a different bunch of different ways with the title, but the fact that you did that and so forth. So kudos to you. Very, very well We're done, Lorraine. Thank you. Any questions about Lorraine's piece? Where was that taken, Lorraine? I'm curious. Uh, yeah, oh, good God. You could do 7,000 yeah. photos of flight delays. Lorraine knows her best. I took about three shots. And I had one of the part the next to her, and it had a lot of other people. And then you talk about cropping, and I'm sitting there going back and forth on with her. But I kind of like that one. Mm -hmm. The closest, the intimate of it. Uh, like, yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah, because if you're talking about flight delay, you got that scene right there because they're delayed, or you got people at the bar getting drunk because they're flight delayed. Yeah. Either way, communicates what it's like in Orlando Thank and National Airport. All right, number one. Yes. Show Peggy Gallagher, oh. and this is uh, Icarus. Oh, yeah, Icarus. I keep trying to read the assembly. Icarus now. is Peggy here? She's not. Oh, my goodness. Citation. So, Peggy, 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 what can I say? Uh, so, first of all, I love that. I mean, if you don't know this already, right? This is telling us the story the Greek myth of Icarus who flew too close to the sun. <laughs> Or in this case, too close to a lampshade, <laughs> right? With a with a doorknob in the middle. See, right? So I and this again, a little bit of, of critique or bias, right? I I like found art, but I like found art that is used in what I consider a very intentional and purposeful way. Um, and this is not to speak ill of anybody who does this. I don't particularly like found art where people just go digging through the trash and then put it on a piece of canvas. That's not my thing. I'm not telling you that it's not art. I'm just telling it's not my thing. I love the fact that she's using found pieces and creating a, an, an intentional narrative of, of, a, of a story. In this case, to many of us, a familiar story with it. Um, and that it's, it's not done haphazardly. It's done with a very specific intent of communicating. Um, and, and this is another thing that I would share with some of you to think through. You don't know what's going to be in a show when you put your piece in. The lesson should be, don't not keep put your piece in. And I don't know what Peggy was thinking about, about if she was or wasn't. But where I'm going with this is, I would be dishonest with you if I didn't tell you that another one of the reasons that this piece was appealing to me, not the only one, but it was, I think, the only 3D piece in the entire show. Now, Peggy didn't know that. You didn't know that. But I would be dishonest, like I said, if I didn't tell you that I'm walking around looking at all these 2D pieces that this does. Now, if, if, if it wasn't something that spoke to me artistically, it wouldn't matter. Yeah, it was one of them. Um, but it spoke to me artistically. And the fact that it, it stood out, no pun intended, because it did, 
because it was a 3D piece. So the lesson for me as an artist, and I'm hoping you take away is, you don't know, maybe you put your 2D piece in a show that's got a bunch of mixed media in, and suddenly your piece stands out. You can't know that is what I'm saying, unless the show specifically says we're looking for you know this particular type of medium. But when it's an open call, um, be encouraged, put the photographs in. You know, for a long time, I resisted put, doing my photography because while I, I thought of it as an art form, I, I didn't think it could compete with people who could paint so beautifully. I didn't think that. Um, I, I've changed my perspective on that, mainly because I've, I've studied and looked at other artists whose photographs do, do speak artistically and so forth. So don't, don't you know, let that be a, an encouragement to you to put your work in, even though sometimes you might not think it, it's up, either up to the caliber or it's, it's going to be um, uh, worthy of consideration. Um, and again, I don't, I'm not saying Peggy felt that way at all, but I am saying the reverse is it helped her that she was one of the few 3D pieces in there to it. Any, any comments on this piece? I don't think we need to take it around. Nope. All right. Any before I'm done, because I know Ron said maybe you want to talk a little bit about Ridge Ridge Arts and and the direction that he and his team are moving back. Any any questions that you all happen to have for me? Yes, Lorraine. How do you feel about being a photographer and a people doing photography on their cell phones? Um, so great question. So I approach that from th this is always again very very personal. You ask me. So I'll tell me, tell you mine. You may disagree, right? Everybody's got their opinion. I approach the photography from the perspective of what, what do I want to do with the photo? So for example, if I have a, I'm blessed, I have a two-year-old granddaughter, right? I, as you might imagine, I take a lot of photos. I could show them to you right now. If we had a screen, I'd put them up there, right? Because um, I love my granddaughter. I don't plan to print those photos. I don't plan, I mean, I may have one for my desk, right? I don't plan to enter them in shows. I don't plan to do anything really artistically with it. So I'm going to use my cell phone and I'm not going to worry about it. I, let me take the flip side. I, um, I think John may know this. I shoot uh, on, with a digital camera and it's uh, what's called a digital medium format. So it, it, the, uh, instead of a 35 millimeter sensor, my sensor is like this. It's massive. So I get files that are 100 megabyte files. And when I do post-processing, they're like a gigabyte. They're huge. Why do I do that? Because when I'm using that camera, I'm purposely choosing that camera as opposed to this because I'm trying to blow it up. I do, I do two feet by three feet photos. Or I'm going to crop really tight. And it looks like I was zoomed in with a big lens because I've got so much detail. And I'm sharing that with you because it's just about being intentional. Now, I know some people who shoot amazing work with their iPhones. So my, the short, that's a long answer. The short version of that is it's a tool. I know some other people who use this as um, even photographers who will take, who, um, who will use this kind of like, like a sketchbook. They'll use their phone to take test pictures and then maybe go back out the next day or whatever or, or later and shoot like that. So it's a tool. I don't, I don't have a, a, a problem with it at all. Um, I have printed some images off of my iPhone. Um, there's an old cliche. Some of you probably heard it that you know people say ask you, well, what's the best camera? The one you have with you. Yeah, well, I, but I will say the newer generation yeah. phones, photo, photo, photographs are way different. Correct. With just a few. Yes, this is the, this is the latest iPhone, um, and so I I would have no hesitation at all printing. Uh, one of my iPhone pictures up to 16 by 20. And you wouldn't know it was from a phone. I wouldn't have done that five years ago. Right. No. But you can do that. Now I still, I still, if I'm if I'm going intentionally to take, you know, take like I, I I travel around, like I said, I was in Portugal last year. I had my big heavy camera, I'm lugging it around, it's killing me. But that's because I was intentionally there to take pictures, you know, of that. Yes, I took iPhone pictures of us having, you know, food at the restaurant. Um, and ironically, some of the, those are some of the better pictures, but that's a different story. <laughs> I have to say, I don't know if you know Greg Adams. I was at his home this week. He has a picture there, a black and white, and it just looked at so unusual. And he said, yeah, it was done with a, with, with a camera. So, come on, a pinhead, pinhole. Pinhole camera, yeah. Wow. And 
That's very uh, at least sophisticated as you can get, but you should have seen the effect that it created. It's amazing. Yeah. Pinhole camera. Yeah. And now, it, that's not high tech. No, it? not at all. No, and there's something to be said for using um, some of that that uh, different approaches with s typical or standard type things. Yes, sir. I just wanted to ask you, you know Clyde Butcher? I know Clyde, yeah. I've actually hosted, when I was at Harrison, I had an exhibit in this work. Yeah, big box. It's he, like from the 1800s. Yeah, Clyde. <laughs> if you're not familiar with what he's talking about, Clyde Butcher is a famous Florida photographer, and he's famous. Um, I, I, I love Clyde because he's the first person that I've ever seen take pictures of something I was familiar with, Florida, and make it look like art. I've grown up around swamps my whole life. My family's from the Panhandle. Uh, I, I I know all about Florida, and this guy made it look like art, um, and it blew me away. And the other thing he does is his pictures are giant; they're like four feet by five feet photos. And it's great. You're right. His, his story is so fantastic. He uses what what they essentially called, you know, a full frame kind of uh, a box camera, four by five. So his negatives, you've seen little negatives, right? His negatives are the size of this. And then he prints. That's why he can print so large. Um, but he, my favorite story about Clyde was he was he was out in the swamp and he's got his big tripod. And he lugs it all out there. And, he's, and, and he, by the way, he gets one shot. And he has no monitor. He doesn't know what it looks like till he gets that big old thing back. So he'll get it out there. He took the picture of the swamp, gets it back in the studio. It's blurred. Goes back out, takes a picture, gets back in. It's blurred. He does that four or five times. He cannot think because he can't see it when he's out there. He cannot figure out why it's blurry. Here's why it was blurry. He finally figured it out. His tripod was so heavy that while he was snapping the picture, it was slowly sinking into the swamp. <laughs> and he didn't even know it. Because you couldn't see it until he got back and he saw it was blurry. So, yeah. That's funny. Water. Yeah, he gets in the water. Yeah, I'm a big fan of Clyde. Actually, I own a couple of his prints. Yeah. Well, I have been to a studio in Venice. My favorite one is his studio um, yeah. in the Everglades. He's got, if you've ever gone on the uh, Tamiami Trail in Ochopee, it's, a, it's, it, you, it's in the, literally in the middle of the swamp. You're driving, nothing's there, and then there's this little art gallery, and it's, it's just a fantastic thing. If you, or, if you get a chance to see it, it's great. Yeah, it's great. He's a great artist. I'm a big, a big influence on my own work. I don't, I don't take pictures like he does really anymore, um, but it was very inspiring.